Well, good afternoon and uh, welcome to the second meeting in 2018 of the Scottish Commission for Public Audit. Can I just remind everybody to, if they've got electronic devices, to switch them off? And as always, can I ask members to, right from the outset, keep the questions and the answers concise and to the point. Now, agenda one is, uh, item one is a decision on taking business in private. Uh, and that asks the agreement of members to take agenda items four and five in private. Are members agreed? Agreed. Thank you. To move on to agenda item two, which is consideration of Audit Scotland's spring budget revision 2018-19. Members have a copy of the spring budget revision in their meeting papers. I'll welcome Ian Leach, chair of the, the board of Audit Scotland. And Ian's accompanied by Caroline Gardner, the Auditor General, Dan McGiffin, Chief Operating Officer, and Stuart Dennis, Corporate Finance Manager of, all of Audit Scotland. I'll invite Ian Leach and then the Auditor General to make any short introductory remarks. No, no introductory from you, Ian? No, not on this subject, Chair. You know my views on this rather mysterious proposal. In that case, Auditor General. Thank you, convener. As in previous years, the spring budget revision requests budget cover for the non-cash pension charge that will arise as a result of accounting adjustments in 2018-19. As you know, these adjustments are notional and they don't generate cash movements. We aren't able to plan for them in advance due to the timing of the information we receive from our actuaries and the Scottish Government has advised us to deal with them through the spring budget revision process. <coughs> the amount involved this year is £2.918 million. We'll do our best to answer any questions that the Commission may have. Thank you. Um, well, the obvious question is what uh, preliminary discussions have you had with uh, the Scottish Government? to confirm that the previously agreed arrangements with the um, Treasury remain in place in respect to the pension adjustment, and have you advised them of the amount of Audit Scotland's requirement? The answer to both qu questions is yes, Chair. Um, we've had the usual discussions with them. They're aware of the amount involved, and they support the uh, submission we're making to the Commission today. Can I open up to any other members who might have questions or comments to make? None? In that case, I've only got one small additional question to ask. In the, the paper on uh, uh, page 4, uh, paragraph 19, the expectation of continuing low interest rates in the next few years may require similar large accounting charge adjustments in 2019-20 and beyond. A little bit alarming, really, but uh, it has been the pattern for the past few years. Is there any, logically you would think, and I, I know very little about these things, but logically you would think that once you've plugged a gap, it doesn't keep reappearing. And you've gone to the heart of why this is a complex matter, Chair. Um, the accounting adjustments that we have to make aren't about um, covering a deficit in a pension fund. They're to do with the um, accounting adjustments that are needed uh, to cover the accounting entries that relate to the pension scheme. Um, Stuart can talk you through the accounting entries if you'd like to know more about it, uh, but this isn't a funded scheme where um, we're looking to plug the deficit. That's handled separately in the contributions we make. This is the accounting entries that are required to reflect the movements around the pension scheme as a whole, and I'll hand over to Stuart to explain it to you. Yeah, there's really f three elements each year around the figure. It's, it's the projected current service costs, so that's the cost in year of the, the staff that you have for the benefits that they, they get by the end of March each year. Um, and on top of that, we will then have the interest income on plan assets and the interest cost on defined benefits. So there's multiple things that influence this, and that's offset by the contributions that we make as an employer as part of the different valuation that Caroline mentioned in eventually plugging the gap in a, a future future date. So this is really the in-year cost that we have on that. Thank you. No one has any other questions? In that case, thank you very much. And uh, I guess we move to agenda next agenda item. Um, which is evidence and audit Scotland's budget proposal for 2019-20. Again, members have a copy of the budget proposal in their meeting papers. 
it's the same witnesses for this agenda item, so without further ado, I, I don't know, you know, perhaps this time you, you, you've got uh, an introductory remark to make, followed by uh, the Auditor General. Yes, we'll be happy to answer any questions uh, on the budget that members may have, and thank you for the invitation, Chair and members. Very brief statement. All members will be aware that we are in uncertain times at the moment. On reflection, that's pretty much an understatement of what's going on in the world. Like the public bodies that we audit, we ourselves are having to navigate a course through this to run our business and to manage risks and uncertainty. We are attempting to do this while recognising limited public resources and keeping audit fees at a reasonable level. But at the same time, we are mindful of maintaining and improving the quality of audit, just as further new financial powers and bodies are coming into being in Scotland. As such, we have produced our budget proposal, taking these factors into consideration in as much as we can. Our resource requirement is 7.564 million, an increase of £416,000 from 2018-19. That is 4.2% in real terms and relates largely to people costs. This is in line with the long-term planned investment in the organisation as set out in previous years to your Commission Chair. The 2019-20 aspects of that plan are detailed in the proposal. And with your permission, Convener, after that brief introduction, I'll hand you over to Carolyn Gardner in her capacity as Accountable Officer. Thank you, Ian. New financial powers continue to be rolled out to the Scottish Parliament. Um, as the Commission knows, these include major new responsibilities, such as the transfer of social security powers. Our budget proposal will enable us to continue our statutory audit responsibilities, take on the audit of these significant new expenditure and revenue raising responsibilities, and support the Scottish Parliament in its important role of holding government to account. As we indicated last year, we've developed a four-year plan that reflects the implementation of the new financial powers, and this proposal represents the second year of that plan. <coughs> Finally, convener, as the chair of the board has said, we're all working in an environment of great uncertainty at the moment. We've reflected that in our proposal as well as we can at this stage, but we will keep a close eye on events as they unfold and keep in touch with the Commission during that process. As ever, we're happy to answer the Commission's questions. Thank you. Um, perhaps I can just ask the first question then. Uh, on the table on page 7 and further explained on page 8, Audit Scotland's advised that uh, following the approval of the 2018-19 budget in December 2017, a further £262,000 of cost pressure were identified. Um, can you provide a bit more information on the sources of that additional cost pressure and why have the additional cost pressures been met solely by additional charges to audited bodies? Yeah, I'll ask Stuart to pick that up in detail, but the biggest movement involved in there is the increased audit fees for integration joint boards, um, which were new bodies established in 2016 or 2017, um, and where they are gradually taking on um, significant new responsibilities for health and social care. Stuart. Yeah, the, um, as you're aware, the budget that we prepare is, is done every July, August time. Um, and we submitted the budget proposal last year prior to the um, Scottish Government budget being announced. Um, so we were basing the pay award policy on the ongoing 1% um, cost of living. Um, in, in addition, as um, Caroline said, we also had um, an element of before that time as well is the fee fees we can't analyze until the audits have completed so the 16 17 fees um, weren't completed by the time we build in our budget so what then happened is is once that's then done and the SC and the SCPA approved our budget submission last year we've revisited and there's been adjustments um, in respect of the pay policy primarily, and also um, the base fee increase for the volume that's um, increased in the integrated joint boards. Hmm. OK, can I throw it open then to the members? Alison, I think you wanted something there. Um, well, uh, um, moving on to, to sort of explore the, the additional work requirements and the impact that will have, um, you, you've highlighted that in 2019-20, um, because of increased financial and performance audit work on Social Security Scotland, um, 
and further work with the National Audit Office in respect of Scotland's VAT share and Scotland's rate of income tax. Um, you're proposing a further four and a half whole time equivalents at a cost of £285,000 to deliver that additional workload. So I'd just like to um, understand when you presented your 2018 19 budget in December 2017, you were suggesting that one whole time equivalent would be required for the for that year 2019 20 so it, I, I presume that additional information or a greater understanding of, of what's going to be required has has meant that that's increased by three and a half um it's a timing difference rather than an increase um I, you you may recall that our four-year plan suggested that at the end of that period we'll have an additional 20 people in place to cover the full um, range of the new responsibilities of the scottish parliament and the scottish government um the exact timetable for the rollout of the new financial powers isn't fixed and, and keeps changing um so for example on social security the scottish government has now entered into an agreement with department for work and pension to take on responsibility for some of the benefits sooner um, and that means that the audit work needs to ramp up more quickly. Um, I'm just about, about to appoint an order to the new Social Security Agency to cover that um, and the timetable for the um, devolution, full devolution of the assignment of VAT revenues is also we think about to be agreed. There are some other changes behind that and I can ask Stuart to talk you through in a bit more detail but it is timing differences within the overall plan rather than changes to the plan that we're looking at. Can I ask how, how you estimate the time that will be required to complete financial and performance audit work for an entirely new body? Um, there is an element of judgment involved, as you would expect. Um, we uh, use our own audit experience of bodies of a similar size and look at the particular functions and responsibilities of this body to see what we think is likely to be needed. My team have worked very closely with colleagues in the National Audit Office who've got a good deal of experience of auditing the Department for Work and Pensions to get a better understanding of the systems that will need to be audited and the risks that will, be needed, that will need to be taken account of. Um, and we're taking a phased approach to implementation, so we currently have a small team responsible for um, all, of, all of our work on Social Security, the audit of the agency and the performance audit work, mm -hmm. and we will build that up um, both as the um, timetable for taking on the new responsibilities is firmed up and as we build up our own expertise and experience around it. So we, we're clear that 4.5 is the right number for 2019-20 and there are then two years of the plan after that that we can flex as the timetable unfolds. Okay. Um, given that Audit Scotland will work with the National Audit Office um, in relation to some audit work, how do you avoid duplication um, of audit effort and... You know, how can you demonstrate value for money um, in, in these circumstances? It's a really good question, one that we are spending a lot of time working on with our colleagues in the National Audit Office now. Um, I think the first thing to say is that the devolution of these responsibilities to the Scottish Parliament doesn't reduce the size of the National Audit Office's audit of the DWP because of its scale and complexity. Um, we have a memorandum of understanding in place between myself and the Comptroller and Auditor General at a UK level, um, which sets out um, what work we will do to satisfy the needs of, our, of each of our parliaments, of the UK Parliament and the Scottish Parliament. Um, and the legislation includes some requirements for the CNAG to report to this Parliament the expectation is that I will provide additional assurance, um, letting this Parliament know that its interests are being taken account of during that process and that I've got no concerns about the work being done. Um, we are due to have an update of the audit accountability framework between the two governments, um, which will set out how this works once all of the new responsibilities have been devolved. Um, that's still subject to, to discussion between the two governments, um, but it's, uh, I think, an important area to make sure that both parliaments are getting the assurance they require, as well as making sure that there is no overlap in terms of the responsibilities that each of us carry. I mean, in terms of that, that duplication and, and overlap question, to what extent has Audit Scotland considered or discussed transferring resource between audit agencies um, where responsibility for audit work changes? For example, from the National Audit Office to, to Audit Scotland, such as with Social Security. We have considered the question with colleagues in the National Audit Office, and I think it's fair to say they're very strongly of the view that the devolution 
of the new financial powers to Scotland doesn't reduce their audit requirement at all. Um, the amount of money involved is very significant for Scotland at about £3 billion a year, but it's actually very small in the context of the overall DWP budget. Um, and if anything, there's, there's more complexity while DWP is continuing to, continuing to administer some of the benefits on behalf of the Scottish Government. Um, so we'll keep that under... Uh, consideration, but at the moment it looks as though the overall uh, volume of audit that's required will increase um, as a result of the devolution of the new powers. Okay. Okay. I think Thank you. To come in supplementary on this point on social security, uh, Auditor General, I may be straying slightly into uh, the audit committee's uh, jurisdiction here, but on social security, will the audit include um, an assessment of the set-up costs of the social security and system in Scotland? Yes, it will. Um, <clears throat> the financial framework was clear about who would bear the um, set-up costs for all of the new financial powers, including social security um, and the contribution that the UK government would make towards that. I look at that as part of my performance audit work at the moment and reported on it, I think, back in April this year on an interim basis. I'm due to update that next year, um, and it's something which the Comptroller and Auditor General will be looking at through the lens of the DWP at the same time, so that information will be available to Parliament. Uh, finished, Alison? Rona? Thank you, Convener, yes. <clears throat> on page nine, um, you set out your work programme for 2019-20, and it's based on the five-year rolling programme of national performance audits. Can I ask what role um, the availability of resources plays um, in deciding the priorities for this programme? Um, and, you know, based on the, the Chair's remarks too about, you know, uncertain times and financial unpredictability. So how do you, has that become a difficult task for you? Um, the um, process is managed by Audit Scotland on behalf of me and the Auditor General. Um, and what we aim to do is to have a rolling five-year programme with certainty over the next two years and then an indicative programme for the years ahead, um, both so that we can um, make the best use of our staff time and of the um, general intellig intelligence gathering we're doing to inform the programme and so that the people we're auditing and Parliament have got a sense of what's coming. Now, it's... Um, programme is, is fairly, you feel it's fairly set, fairly secure, and beyond that is, is just, you know, based on events, is that um, the idea? It's certainly um, more, more strongly committed in the first couple of years, because by this point, work that we're publishing next summer will all already be well underway, so we know that's happening. But we do aim to keep some flexibility in there so that we can respond to events. Um, the obvious example right now is the impact of EU withdrawal and what happens over the next 12 months there. But other things do emerge from time to time. But the question yeah. actually was, was, was how do you, you know, build in, um, uh, you know, is there a, is there a sort of safety net for, for um, events that, that happen? Um, there's, there's enough there that would could cope with you know anything that would crop up unexpectedly um, we manage it within the program on the mm. basis that it, it's not appropriate for us to have a large chunk of uncommitted resource it's it's money that's coming from other parts of the public sector so we don't do that and we can't carry reserves forward as you know but within the program we're very clear um, how we can flex it to respond to events. Um, that's possible to a limited expen extent over the next 12 to 18 months, but to a much greater extent for the remaining three years. If you need to, to move on here. Exactly okay. right. And for example, we have got a category now around EU withdrawal specifically, where we've mm. committed some resources to that as an area without yet finding down the scope of what that will actually look at. There's too much uncertainty yeah. to do that yet. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <coughs> thank you. Jenny. Thank you. Uh, Chair, Auditor General, the, um, your budget um, proposes to increase management contingency, actually double it from 150 to 300,000. Why is that? Um, it's a direct response to the uncertainty that we're facing now. Uh, because we aren't able to carry um, reserves forward, um, and obviously I, I'm not prepared to risk overspending our budget, we have, um, for a long period, run a small contingency of £150,000, which has been in the proposal we've brought to the Commission in previous years. Um, given the extent of uncertainty that we're now facing, not just in terms of the work that we may need to carry out, as Ms Mackay was exploring, but also what the impact may be on our costs in future, um, given the, the 
range of uncertainty that's around. Um, we are proposing increasing that to 300,000. Um, it's still a very small part of our budget. Um, I think it accounts for 1.2% of our expenditure at the increase level, um, so it's a very small figure, but we think it's an appropriate buffer to have in place mm -hmm. to avoid having to come back to the Commission if um, things turn out um, to have a big impact on our prices and costs next year. Okay. I see Ian Leach nodding. You obviously feel this is quite important, given current circumstances. Yes. Preparedness is a big issue, but prepare for what? <clears throat> There's been guidance issued to, to the auditors who audit all the bodies about the questions they should be asking and see what the state of preparedness is. But every organisation is different. Preparedness for Brexit. Brexit. But what does it mean? I mean, mm -hmm. I've given the example before of the European Agricultural Fund audit. I mean, it's... Uh, paid for through Europe, through the National Audit Office, to us at the tune of £874,000 a year. Now, <clears throat> presumably there'll still be an audit. Presumably there'll still be grants to farmers that will need to be audited. But what will the shape of that be? And more importantly, who's going to decide it? If it's a UK thing and we do it as a sort of agent of the NEO, then the resource should come from the NEO. If, on the other hand, it was to be devolved to the Scottish Government arguably it would not be a chargeable item to Scottish Government because we can't charge for that audit, as you know. So therefore there would have to be met from the Commission approving as a top slice from the Consolidated Fund. We don't know all of these things. We don't know the flexing we've got. We don't know how the staff will be because there's 18 staff members involved in that, that work. So the Contingency Fund and our staff movement, for example, a 6% turnover of staff allows some flexibility. One thing we try to do is to avoid taking too much from the pot of the consolidated fund because if we top slice too much, it's a denial to other parts of the public sector, the use of those resources. There's no point at the end of the day having that as a credit balance because somebody didn't have the opportunity to spend that in, in worthwhile public projects. So all of these factors, uh, it's leading on from the answer given by, by the Auditor General there, is how we're trying to manage our budget within reasonable limits but give us a degree of flexibility. That makes sense. Can I ask, of the 150,000 available in management contingency last year, or this year, how much of it's been used? I think Stuart will be able to give you an answer to that. Yeah, um, last year we actually used half of it, so it was about 75,000 um, in our actual accounts. Um, this year um, we're... There are elements to, to be but, um, decided on that, but whether it will be used in full is probably not um, similar to this year, but we don't know what's going to happen in the next three months, so it might well be used in, in full. Well, let's hope that next year we're living in more certain times and don't have these... Sorry, Diane. Just to add that um, obviously we account for what we've spent out of the management contingency to both the board and to yourself at the final accounts um, stage, so you have that additional assurance. If um, if the unexpected um, changes don't occur, we will be accounting for why we haven't spent the management contingency, but we will be accounting for what we've spent as well. So you have that um, assurance at the other end of the process too, as to the board. Chair, can I continue with this? Um, I want to move on to the cost of audits because we've picked up that um, the cost of audit to local authorities has increased by 4.2%. But I think the cost of audits to other bodies such as NHS and colleges remain broadly the same. Can you explain, Auditor General, why that is? I'll ask Stuart to talk you through the detail in a moment. Um, it's worth reminding the Commission first, I think, that um, the uh, Board has encouraged us over the last few years to provide more transparency about the costs of each sector and how the costs are recovered through fees, um, and also to make sure that we balance each sector as well as the organisation as a whole, taking one year with another. So there's more transparency about that. Um, Stuart can talk you through the um, reason for the changes within the local government sector compared to the others. Yeah, we, we do um, a sector analysis, as the Auditor General said. We looked at we have to break even by a sector um, is what we look for. Um, and included in that is apportionments of overheads. And it's based on um, the data of completion of, of, of audits from the prior year. So what's happened is, is when we collect that data and redistribute it, it means that it's moved around in, in volumes to where it's actually 
um, the work has been done and then that's where the fees and the apportionment of costs go and that balances that off. Give me. I, I'm, I, don't, I don't follow that very well. That, I understand perhaps in yeah. accounting terms, but I, that doesn't explain to me how. Can you take us through that again? Yeah, sure. Um, what, it, um, what we do is um, we have, um, in by sector broadly, we look to break even by sector. So what, what we do is we, we take the amount of audit days um, for each sector and then that is the key driver to how we then distribute the costs in, in our budget um, across the sectors and then that allocates all, all the different overheads. So like finance, HR, IT, depends on where, where the work is. So if that moves around, if the volume moves around slightly, what will happen is, is that more shift of overheads moves around as well. If the volume moves around? The volume, so that's the audit days effectively. Right, so yeah. if there are more audit days yeah. for councils than there yeah. are for colleges, for example, it yes. becomes more expensive. I suppose my question is, why are there more audit days for local authorities than there are for the other bodies? Well, I think for a start, w was when, when we mentioned, would be the integrated joint board. So they've moved, they are a local government sector. Um, and as, as we highlighted, that's an area what we've had to increase based on the volume or audit days that we needed to do. So that would be one of the key areas. Okay. Can I just add to that? Um, I think what you're referring to, Ms. Mara, is the income from charges to um, local government bodies on page 14, which has gone up, as you say, by 4% um, as a result of the volume changes that Stuart's talked about. It might help to refer you to the fees and funding strategy on page 23 of the submission, table one, where you can see that the charges to local government bodies have gone up by 0.5% in real terms. So that's the unit cost has gone up by 0.5%. The volume overall has gone up by 4% because of the, the change in the volume of work that's done. OK, so the, the cost of doing an audit of a council has gone up by, what did you just say, that, that's that's not quite the right conclusion right, either. Okay. The unit cost has gone up, the, the, the fee has gone up by 0.5% um, in real terms on a like-for-like -like basis. That will vary for individual bodies depending on their circumstances, but across the sector that's the case. The overall cost to local government has gone up by about 4% because of the change in the volume of the number of bodies that we're focusing on and the size of the IJB audits as they've taken on their full responsibility, and that's where the 4% comes in. I apologise, this is complex. We don't no, sorry, I apologise, no, I should be following it better. But all. is the differential between the what you're charging them and the cost, who's picking that up, who's picking up that? Local government pays for all of the work of in all of the audit work in local government. So all of the annual audits, the performance audit, and the best value audits are paid for by uh, local government itself through the fees. Okay, thank you, um, Rona. Yes, it's going to be now. Kind of following on from that line of questioning, on page 24, you set out the early rates used to um, to cost audits, and that includes. Um, staff costs. Um, it's notable that um, increases for certain grades of staff are higher than others. Um, for example, the early rate for audit managers has increased by 8.6% from £70 an hour to £76 an hour, whereas the early rate for trainees has fallen by 8.3% from £48 uh, an hour to 44 I wonder if you could expand on that and explain why. I'll ask Stuart to talk you through that. Yes, thank you. Yeah, um, the trainees, as an example, the hourly rates are worked out based on the direct costs. So um, that's the actual pay, national insurance and pension contributions. And then um, there is an overhead element, indirect costs, that's included in that, as it says, uh, above around the property costs, IT, finance. So the, what's happened is, is, is this is based on the budget at a particular time. So we we take what mix of staff there are at that time. So, for example, the trainees has gone down from 48 to 44 is, is based on the mix of trainees and where they are on the pay scales. So when, when it was done in 2017-18, there would have been more at the higher pay scale element than um, when we did it for 2018-19. So, so the trainee rate is on a, a, a scale? 
It's um, not just a flat rate for trainees. It's on a. Um, it depends where they are in their training program. Okay. So um, and the, so the numbers where they are. So we, we have roughly about thirty four trainees. So when when it, in twenty seventeen eighteen there would have been more at the higher point than there was in twenty eighteen nineteen, and then what that drives that is a key driver on the allocation of the overhead. So. If that is drop reducing, taking let that will take less of the overhead element, which means like audit manager will take more because it's at a higher higher level because it's based on a pro rata of the, the level that they are. Is that how it's it's normally always done? Is yes, yeah, yeah. standard practice. Yes, um, I think as we do benchmark um, as a finance forum with other um, audit agencies, and these are very similar levels to. For example, the so Wales comparable office. with other uh, yeah. sector uh, yes. audit sectors. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Bill, I think you wanted to come in with a supplementary there. Yes. Thank you. If I may, um, do you have a budget for the hours? Each um, each audit manager will have a budget for their audit, um, which is expressed at, in terms of both the audit fee that's charged to the body and uh, a standard makeup of the audit team. Um, but as you will know, the actual makeup of an audit team will vary um, depending on the availability of resources and the requirements of a particular audit. And the break up, the breakdown of each grade will vary over time depending on where people are on their pay scales. Do you have a summary then of all the teams to give a total hours budget for the organisation? The, well, the audit services team, which is the team responsible for doing the 70% or so of the annual audits that they carry out, absolutely have that budget and manage it um, very closely for each of the audits they manage. Um, we're then managing the uh, organisational staffing budget as a whole, um, which includes audit services, performance audit, invest value and the corporate services group. Did you... In terms of the previous question, and maybe connected to this, just to perhaps clarify, this isn't a table at paragraph 26 of the the rates paid to trainees. Um, it, it's reflecting the different mix we've got of trainees. There's not been that shift in the salaries of people, but in rather what we're what the total cost of of the audit is at each grade. I just wanted to make that clear if it wasn't um, if it wasn't clear there. Is that what you're it's, saying? It's, um, it's not our trainees are um, all paid a set scale and that hasn't changed. The mix of trainees we have at the point in time that this table is produced has changed from the point in time that it was last produced. The last time it was produced, more trainees were at, at the top end of their grade. Those people have now qualified and have gone on to other roles in the organisation. And this is reflecting that there are more people starting their trainee journey with us but they're all being paid the same rate that's not shifted. I understand that. Is that I hope yeah. that's helpful. I just thought there might be a little bit of doubt yeah, about you. what the table was showing. Coming back, Mr Bowman, to your point, yes, we do have um, all of that data for the audit services um, group who manage the chargeable rates and the hourly um, allocations, and there's and that, that's built up, as you would expect. We're then showing the time they say they spent on clients, time on training, time... Yeah, we have all of, those, um, all of those profiles, and we work through that, uh, through the time recording system, and that's what helps to build up the picture of what the cost should be. Um, Stuart mentioned earlier the shift that we'd made in the integrated joint board charging. That was driven from the use of the time recording data uh, that looked at from the planning assumptions made about integrated joint boards to the reality of how auditors actually spent their time, we recognised we needed to shift um, there. You so see that summary? Um, you can. I, I, um, I could perhaps we could have a, a discussion afterwards about what form yeah, that might sure. look like. Um, I would provide you with assurance that that um, that information is. Um, fed into the financial reporting and so on, which the Audit Committee and the Board yeah. review on a quarterly basis, and I'm very happy to share all of, uh, <coughs> to share that. Okay, we'll come to that then. Um, Bill? Um, yes, yeah, so well, I have a question then, and I'm pleased to see that quality has mentioned quite a lot in your budget proposal. You have your um, quality report, which does in it, within it have a, a regular um, or a, a survey of of the staff and their views. Now, the, the 2017 quality report identifies some areas that the performance has fallen compared to 16-17. For example, 
training and, and development. What are the reasons for the fall in the positive responses from those recorded in the previous year? And aside from the staff survey, um, how else does Audit Scotland assure itself that staff are well supported to deliver quality audits? And finally, how you've got 250,000, I think, to invest in audit quality. How will you do this and how will it address the issues? Okay, could I start? If, sure. I, if I missed the three parts of your question, I'm sure you will prompt me. Um, on the results in the survey, so um, the first thing for your assurance is the survey will be run again and you'll have the results again um, at the end of the year when we publish the next um, annual quality report. The survey hasn't been conducted yet, so I don't know the results for this year, but we'll be looking at them very closely. Um, what we know last year is that... Um, in some parts of the organisation, there were, um, because of the volume of work, there was um, increased pressure, increased um, increased commitments. We've talked about the integrated joint boards, for example, and um, we have looked very closely at the learning and the training and development. We made some changes um, following this, and um, we have changed um, how we organise professional support, which is providing the technical and auditing support and training that helps um, our auditors to be um, up to speed and up to date on all the technical matters that they deliver in their audits. We have um, had a real focus in our learning and development programme this year to join up professional support and our um, learning and development programme. We've offered more events, we've offered a huge um, range of different topics. We've had external providers and internal providers um, coming in. We've had work with the other audit agencies on a whole range of um, activities. At each of those events, we take feedback from colleagues who are taking part in learning and development, and we're also taking stock of how um, teams feel about the um, their ability to respond to the demands that they have. So we're taking um, short-term feedback all the way through the year. We'll run this survey again, and we have another survey that we run with staff, which is anonymous, and um, we'll have the results of that soon. We know that the participation rate in our um, Best Companies survey is very high. This year it's 84%, and it asks a series of questions about learning and development, so we'll await the results of that. We have the results of that going back 10 years, and we can track very carefully what people feel the participation rate for Audit Scotland in this in this particular survey that's reported in the Audit Quality Report didn't achieve that sort of 84, 85% response rate, which is exceptionally high and which is a high response rate that we're used to. So we're also um, working on the timing of this survey and also thinking about how we can make sure that um, people participate. We're very disappointed with the results and we've been working very hard to improve them. Um, People and their skills are the heart of the organisation and we want to make sure that um, our people have the time to devote to learning and development, are supported in learning and development and that we're working to make that um, as effective as possible. So we've been doing lots of work in that area um, and um, we'll see what the survey results tell us. You asked about the audit quality team and what we were doing for that. Um, we have a team of three people. You'll, uh, if you, you've been reading our audit quality report, you'll see them pictured at the front of the um, of the um, document. Um, they are um, regularly reviewing and reporting on audit quality to the Auditor General and to the Accounts Commission and to the Audit Committee of the Audit Scotland Board. They produce five reports in the in a twelve month period, um, and in, including the annual report. In addition to the work that they do, they also commission work from ICAS, um, which means that we are independently, externally reviewing the work of all auditors, um, Audit Scotland and the firms that we appoint. Um, this year, um, the work has just started. We will be reviewing, ICAS will be reviewing, along with the um, quality work that teams will be doing individually, we'll have reviews of about 11% of the audits that we carry out, which is a, a very significant percentage, an increase on last year. So in terms of the quality of the work, we're investing through, as Audit Scotland, through our learning and development strategy to improve the quality of the work. We have a, a comprehensive programme of quality reviews, and we report annually on that. We have independent external review of the work. 
uh, which we publicly report on. And in a development which is unique, I think, across the audit agencies in the UK, we have taken that independent external review and extended it beyond the financial audits to include both the performance audits and our best value audits too, where we're um, treading new ground really in figuring out how to apply really good independent external review of two quite unique um, audit products. So um, I think this year, we have a lot more um, quality review work on the go than we did last year. And last year, we made significant progress in the work that we reported. So you'll see this annual quality report again at the end of the year, and you'll be able to compare another set of results on all of that. Yeah, thank you. Just for um, clarity, I would say I'm a member of ICAS as well, but just a, an ordinary member. It's something we take as one of our key issues is quality. As you know, the profession across the country is somewhat um, in dubious circumstances with the recent happenings with some of the companies and we're particularly keen that the public audit model in Scotland is the best it can possibly be and that's why we're going to all this trouble and concern to make sure we have this team to monitor it and have the independent review and that's why the audit committee and the board consciously seek these reports throughout the year to assure that there's an assurance, because we have to assure you, we have to assure ourselves first, we have to assure the client groups and have to assure you and the Parliament that audit quality is good. Just as a final question then, have the, the reports or the reviews that you've done so far come up with anything that's concerning? Um, not at this point, no. Um, I think the last year's report um, highlighted a thread across all audit providers which I think is highlighted in all reviews of audit, which is the need for better documentation sometimes. So we've been working on that, and as have our partners in the firms. Um, but as at, as at today, there hasn't been any, any significant um, concerns. Can I ask if any members have any other questions they'd like to ask at this point? I've got one or two, if I may. Please. Um, just picking up from the, the submission. Um, well, I've asked about the chargeable hours budget, which I think we'll, we'll get. Speaking about the social security, um, I don't think you, you actually gave a cost or a number of hours to, to do the audit of a new body like that. I didn't. Um, I'll just come back to the commis commission after today's meeting with that figure, if that would be useful. Okay, yeah. There's a capital budget of, what, I think 150? Yep. Down from 175. Now, I think you've got depreciation maybe of 300 and something in the, in the budget elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So a rule of thumb, I, I always thought that you know, your capital should at least be the, you know, the depreciation just to make up for the, you know, the consumption of the mm -hmm. assets. Is, is, is that not the case? I think it's changing because of the way our IT is provided now. Most of the capital budget this year is for IT costs, both hardware and software. But the balance um, of our overall spend on IT is shifting from buying equipment um, and buying licenses to buying subscriptions for cloud storage, for cloud services. Um, we've moved to Office 365, for example, this year. Um, so there is, there's less capital investment to run the IT service than we would have seen in the past. We are still depreciating past assets um, and our leases are, dil are dilapidated, depreciated on the same basis with provisions for dilapidations. So the staff have the correct equipment to do the job? That's absolutely our intention and it's what this year's capital budget is intended to do. Okay. And just one other cost, I know on other committees we get reports from you on various things that go wrong at organisations. Do they get charged in some way for... You know, if a good organisation does nothing wrong, is it in a better position than one that has a number of reports? Uh, yes, for the chargeable audits that we carry out. Probably the clearest example of that um, has been the Scottish Police Authority over recent years, where for a range of reasons we've had to do a lot of extra work to be able to provide an opinion on the financial statements, um, and they have been charged an additional fee to carry that out. That's at the extreme end of the range of what's been needed, but that's the best example just now. 
And does that cost appear in these reports somewhere? So um, it, it inc it's included within the fee income that you see, um, and it's often that. part of the answer that we give you when you ask why the fees for particular bodies have changed. I think we wrote to you last year with more information about the fees that had been higher than predicted, the difference between the budget and the actual. Um, it doesn't appear on the face of it um, because they are uh, they're generally very small movements. Something of that scale is unusual. Okay. Okay, I've got a couple of small questions myself. Um, I noticed that uh, firms employed by Audit Scotland to perform audit functions uh, received a 2% increase in fees. And although it's not a comparison really, the average fee increases were 1.6. Can you confirm that of the chargeable um, auditable bodies, the fees from them cover the increase in the fees for the for the external providers? In, in total, yes. Um, the mechanism for increasing the fees to the firms is set out in the contract we have with each of them following the procurement two and a half, three years ago, which makes a provision that we will uprate the amount we pay to them in line with the base increase to our staffing costs. Um, so 2% is the assumption we have in for both our base increase to staffing costs and for the fees. But that firms. has been recovered on the other side? Absolutely, yes. Okay. And by sector as well as um, across the, the, the budget as a whole. Um, on page five, uh, paragraph nine, you're talking about uh, uh, the so new Social Security Scotland. You're talking about uh, a new auditor for that. You're talking about a new team. Where is the expertise coming for that? Is there special expertise needed? Um, there is certainly special expertise needed. Um, we have some expertise ourselves. Um, we have been uh, auditing housing benefits in local authorities for a number of years now, which provides us with a good starting point. Um, since the um, Smith Commission Agreement and the Scotland Act um, was first being developed, we've, we've recognised the need to build our capacity in this area, and we've worked very closely with our colleagues in the National Audit Office, who have many years' experience of auditing the Department for Work and Pensions and its predecessors. Um, and we have developed some specialist training for the staff who are involved, building on that to make sure we've got the experience that we need. Um, you're absolutely right, though. It is quite a complex and specialised area with particular um, risks, um, both in terms of the level of fraud that's been experienced in uh, the UK as a whole in the past, but also the importance of getting it right for people who rely on benefit payments for their well-being. Um, so we absolutely recognise the importance of making sure our teams are properly skilled to do that. Diane, do you want to add to that? Um, we've been recruiting um, this year a lot, and I think in the year to date we've... Um, had 19 new starts in the organisation. There's quite a lot of um, um, resourcing internally where we're um, looking at the mix of experience and skills that we have and the career opportunities that people want. We've also been, um, as you know, we've got a very strong commitment to our graduate training scheme and a very strong commitment to growing our own expertise um, and so on. We, take, we took on an additional two graduates last year above what we had um, notionally planned to help make sure that through flowing through into the new social security work there'll also be a range of skill mix so there'll be graduates there'll be experienced staff there'll be new people so that we can get that diversity in our teams that will really help us I think make uh, the most um, of the opportunity that we have to set up a new team and expand the organisation so there's a, a, a mix it's been um it's a challenging, um, a challenging um, environment in which to create new teams, but it's also a real opportunity for us because we're ex we've been expanding slightly as an organisation, and that's been a welcome growth with welcome career opportunities in it for existing colleagues and for new members who've joined. Is, I get the impression that there's increasing specialisation within Audit Scotland, within particular areas. For example, we're talking now about the special skills needed for social security. We've talked previously about special skills needed for IT audits and so forth. Are we, in, are we increasingly having to rely on people who are specialists in their own areas? And is that creating any sort of silo effect within Audit Scotland? 
I think you're right that our work is becoming more complex and um, the range of bodies that we audit is increasing with things like social security and tax raising for the first time. Um, we work quite hard to make sure we've got the balance right between having as much flexibility as we can in our resourcing and giving people the sorts of career development opportunities that Diane was referring to, um, while also having the, the um, real specialism we need for areas like social security that are, that are quite um, particular. Um, our workforce plan is part of addressing that. Um, it aims to make sure we're thinking ahead about what skills we need so that we've got the chance to develop them internally and to recruit to them. Um, but I think the core that runs through all of it is audit skills. Um, Ian referred earlier to the staff who are working on the audit of the European Agricultural Funds. We have about 20 staff working on that um, and if that work um, finishes because of the way in which we leave the EU, they are all qualified auditors who will be able to work on other parts of our um, portfolio of work uh, rather than running the risk of them not being able to be redeployed elsewhere. So that, that's an example of the sort of balance we try to maintain. doesn't mean it always works smoothly in the short term, but that's our intention for the longer term. On page seven, I was just noticing you've got people costs going up, numbers of staff going up, but you've got your administrative costs going down. How realistic is that? Um, the reductions in the other administrative costs are all identified reductions, a combination of savings and cost reductions, and I think Stuart can give you a bit more detail about what's included there. We think it is realistic is the important point. Yeah, I think some, well, some of them will be um, in respect to property costs, um, which will be coming down. Um, obviously, there was mentioned earlier about depreciation, that cost is coming down, um, and also our travel and subsistence is coming down. That, that's a combination of um, the car scheme that we had for staff um, ceasing um, on the 1st of April 17, and as staff leave that were members of that, that then reduces the cost there. So everything that's been identified to reduce is, we, is achievable. Just the real, co the real decrease in cost is actually greater because those costs are supporting more staff. Yes, it's, the costs are, are coming down, but um, even though there's more staff, some of them don't get the, well, won't for, the, for example, the car scheme won't get the benefit. So that's, that's a, a genuine saving. Um, things like um, the, the rate, business rates that we have, um, that, that cost has come down. Um, so, so all the savings we've identified are actual ones that are, are deliverable, even though the staff numbers are, are increasing. Okay, one last question. On Appendix 2, page 19, uh, performance and best, best value audit. For some reason, I'd never realised before that uh, local authorities only pay half of that. Um, performance and best value audit convener on page 19, are you looking? Page 19, yep. Appendix 2. So the total cost is 3.9 million broadly, of which local authorities pay 2 million um, and the parliament pays 1.8 million. Um, local government is paying for all of the performance audit work in best value and all of the best value audit work in local government. Um, the SCPA, the Consolidated Fund, um, picks up the cost of all of the performance audit work that's done in the NHS, central government and uh, the further education sector on the back of the fees and funding strategy that we agreed with you um, at the beginning of this process. Okay, thank you. Do any members have any other questions they want to ask? In that case, thank you very much for attending today and uh, we now move into private session.